Hi everyone, I hope you're all well. So in the past week, Australia has seen one of the most extraordinary examples of misplaced feminist rage that I think I've ever encountered, and believe me, I have encountered an awful lot. Bettina Arndt, social commentator and virulent advocate for men's issues, has been made a member of the Order of Australia, which is a huge deal. The award was for significant service to the community as a social commentator and to gender equity through advocacy for men. And from the moment this award was announced, feminist minds all over Australia exploded. You see, feminists think they have a monopoly on gender equality because they believe it only goes one way, that is, promoting the needs of women at the expense of men. And because they are neo-Marxists, they have this rather daft idea that there is only so much equality to go around and that therefore any discussion of men's issues detracts from the discussion of women's issues. Ridiculous assertion, of course, but hey, that is a uh, modern feminism for you. Now, this feminist outrage got to such a point that the Attorney General of the state of Victoria, Jill Hennessy, wrote to the Governor General of Australia imploring him to strip Bettina of her award, a move that was applauded by feminists everywhere, which is somewhat ironic, but you know, whatever. The reasons that Jill Hennessy gave were that Bettina apparently blames and shames victims of sexual violence, sympathized with a convicted child abuser, and apparently diminishes the devastating experiences of domestic violence victims through her views and activities. Now, those are some pretty serious allegations if they're true, but as anyone with even the smallest bit of experience with feminist allegations will know, 99% of the time they're not true. They're just fabricated claims strung together by out of context quotes, hastily made assumptions and outright lies in order to demonize someone that they don't like because they can't get them on the facts. So how exactly does this apply to Bettina Arndt? Well, before I tell you, I would love it if you would subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Now, I'm sure you have already watched one or two of my videos, maybe even three, and you just haven't hit that subscribe button yet. So if you like my content and you want to see more, then now would be the perfect time to subscribe. I would really love to get to 200,000 subscribers by my birthday in July. That'd be very, very cool. So pretty please hit that subscribe button now. I would love to have you. Right, so what does Bettina actually believe? Well, in summary, this. My main message I want to get out is we don't live in a fair society. Laws, rules and regulations are being tilted to favour women at the expense of men. And most people think that's not gender equity, that's not a fair deal. Um, so I'm out there trying to motivate people to help with trying to achieve a proper level, level playing field. Now, to your average person, all of that sounds perfectly reasonable, of course. But in advocating for men, Bettina has challenged two of the most sacred and lucrative narratives presented by radical feminists. First, that domestic violence is a women's issue caused primarily by gender inequality, which of course it's not. And two, that university campuses are hotbeds of rape and misogyny, which of course they're not. See the video description for sources. Now, in typical feminist fashion, rather than argue their case to Bettina on a factual intellectual level, Australian feminists have tried every dirty trick in the book for years to try to take Bettina down. Their most recent attack was an article for an online rag called New Matilda, co-authored by Chris Graham and a feminist journalist named Nina Funnel. Remember that name. This article, which was released in perfectly timed fashion just in the wake of the announcement of Bettina's award and included parts of an interview done with Bettina herself, was the result of a two years long investigation, not into Bettina's sources or her arguments, but into her university qualifications. The article's billed as a sort of expose of Bettina, who they imply has been knowingly falsely representing herself as a clinical psychologist for decades, when really she only actually has a master's of psychology which she got in the 70s and, and she isn't registered with the relevant public body, so she's been leading people on, so ha, she's not credible. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. Of course, none of that is actually the case. When Bettina obtained her Master of Psychology from UNSW in 1973, that was the newest, highest quality qualification for psychology available, and it was not a requirement at the time to register as a psychologist in order to practice. That was the situation for the first 16 years of Bettina's career. 
When the requirements for being a psychologist in New South Wales began to tighten up over the years, Bettina stopped referring to herself as a clinical psychologist and instead referred to herself as someone who is trained as a clinical psychologist, which you can actually see here at the bottom of this 2018 article written by Bettina for Quillette, which clearly states, Bettina aren't trained as a clinical psychologist before becoming one of Australia's first sex therapists. Also, Bettina's CV is available on her website and has been available there for years and years. In addition, there have been complaints made by activists about Bettina's representation over the last few years to the authorities who have decided every time that Bettina has breached no rules and is doing nothing wrong. As Bettina has also stated, there are numerous interviews with her on the public record where she describes starting work as a sex therapist, which was her major. However, within a year, she decided it was more effective to do sex education through the media, hence the fact she didn't register as a psychologist when that became a requirement for the job in 1989. Because she worked mainly through the media, she had no interest in promoting or updating her clinical psychology qualifications nor did she actually seek any sort of business as a psychologist during that time. So no, Bettina has not been willfully misrepresenting herself as a clinical psychologist. In fact, Bettina doesn't actually like psychology as a profession. As she stated to new Matilda, I gave up psychology quick smart because it bored me to tears. I felt that psychology was useless when it came to educating the community about sex. They didn't need one-to-one -one therapy to teach people about sex in the 1970s. What was needed was basic sex education. So that's what I did from a very early age. My job was using the media for sex education and that morphed then into social commentary about gender issues. Psychology does not do a good job educating people and it's misrepresenting a whole range of issues. I have no interest in being associated with psychology. I do my best to distance myself from that profession. So. If Bettina has had her CV on her website for years, has been very open about her transition away from psychology early in her career, stopped referring to herself as a clinical psychologist when the rules got tighter, and doesn't actually have a lot of time for psychology as a profession, then how can anybody say she has been falsely representing herself as a clinical psychologist? The only thing that that new Matilda article really seems to maybe have is that 80 or so media outlets have referred to Bettina as a clinical psychologist when introducing her and she hasn't corrected them. Apparently that is evidence that somehow Bettina is happy to let the media misrepresent her because she's some sort of fraud. But again, as Bettina has said to new Matilda, you can't start every interview by correcting your host. I mean, I do sometimes, I have done many times, but I've done, I don't know how many thousands of interviews in my life. When you have a two minute television interview and I have an important message to say, I am not going to spend the first minute going through my qualifications, am I? I try to do so after the interview when I get an opportunity. I'm always trying to be extremely honest about what I do and how I got into this business. And as Bettina has also said, there are tons of people working in the media who are still referred to by their original qualifications as doctors or even psychiatrists, etc., even if they haven't practiced for years. It's a mark of experience. It's not an insistence that they're something that they're not. Now, the important thing about that new Matilda article is that Bettina was not told prior to doing the interview that Nina Funnell was to be one of the co-authors. That's rather unscrupulous, particularly when Bettina has said that had she known Nina was going to be part of it, she would not have done the interview. And here's why. Nina is an ambassador for End Rape on Campus, an initiative that has sown the seeds of panic over an alleged rape crisis on university campuses in Australia. The organization has pushed for a number of surveys to be done in the hopes of finding evidence of some sort of scandalous data about sexual assault on campus and is at least partly responsible for the instigation of kangaroo courts at universities to assess allegations of sexual harassment and assault. These kangaroo courts use a lower burden of proof than an actual criminal court does and operate on a believe the victim basis, which is reminiscent of that old medieval adage, guilty until proven innocent. 
In fact, these kangaroo courts are so regressive, a Queensland Supreme Court case in late 2019 found them to be illegal. Anyway, Bettina has been a little bit of a thorn in Nina's side. She has directly contradicted Nina's rape crisis narrative by highlighting the fact that a survey done by the Australian Human Rights Commission in 2017, which was supported by End Rape on Campus and other activists and was the great golden hope with which to prove the narrative of a university rape crisis, actually did quite the opposite. The survey found that only 0.8% per year of the 30,000 surveyed reported any sexual assault, even using the broadest possible definition, which included tricked into sex against your will and sexual contact with a stranger on the bus or train trip to university. Now that's still too high a number, there should be zero, but it's nowhere near a crisis situation. In addition to that, Bettina points out that according to the New South Wales Bureau of Crime Statistics, campuses are about 100 times safer than the rest of the community for young women. Now this result was not what feminist activists hoped for, which Bettina made known with her 2018 fake rape crisis tour of university campuses, an initiative operating in direct opposition to the End Rape on Campus organization. So given Nina's association with End Rape on Campus, there is a massive, massive conflict of interest with Nina's reporting on Bettina, which no media outlets have acknowledged. According to Bettina, Nina Funnel has been instrumental in perpetuating a lot of the fake news being circulated about her, like not so subtly implying that Bettina is a child abuse apologist. Bettina did an interview with convicted child abuser Nicholas Bester in 2017 on her YouTube channel. Using very select quotes sliced and diced out of context, Nina wrote for news.com.au that Bettina had said that the 15-year-old victim's behavior was sexually provocative and that the interview was highly sympathetic to Bester, painting him as the victim and the 15-year-old as the aggressor. He's a man who made mistakes, served his time in prison, a man, I believe, should be allowed to get on with his life. Oh, I lost everything. I lost my home. I'd been married for 37 years. I lost my marriage. I lost my children. I lost my job. I lost my status in the community. I lost absolutely everything. Here we have an example where evidence of the girl's sexually provocative behaviour was presented to the judge. The question that remains for me is whether there's any room in this conversation for talking to young people, particularly young girls, about behaving sensibly and not exploiting their seduc seductive power to ruin the lives of men. Now, this article was preceded by an episode of 60 Minutes making the same allegations as Nina. But, of course, this was not the full story. Here's the context for that interview as relayed by Bettina to Studio 10 at the end of January this year. Let me explain why I got involved in this issue. A judge in Hobart spoke out about what was happening to Nicholas Bester. Here's a man who did, did a terrible thing. He, a, a teacher who had sex with his pupil, which is obviously totally unacceptable. He goes to prison for that. And he serves his sentence. He's let out. And the University of Tasmania agreed that he should be allowed to do his PhD there. And he was targeted um, by feminists in Tasmania who decided he would be their, their Me Too poster boy. Every time he left the house, they were out there screaming abuse at him. They persuaded the university to st gradually to stop him being allowed to access the university. And this judge said, we don't have a society where we have vigilante groups determining our justice. We have a criminal justice system to punish people, and when they have been punished, they should be allowed to get on with their lives. You don't show the fact that I talked to him about how serious his crime was, talked to him how important... Uh, got him to acknowledge that he'd done something that was a criminal offence and that was right he went to prison. All of that is left out. Tiny segments are being used as part of but a really... But they were the segments that devastated Grace Tame, the victim. I can understand her point of view and I have apologised for the tone of some of that interview. But I don't apologise for addressing the issue of whether people who serve their crimes should be allowed to get on with their lives. I think that's an important part of our criminal justice system. Mm. So, very clearly not a child abuser apologist. Another way that feminists try to smear Bettina is by accusing her of being a rape apologist. They do this by claiming that the very existence of her fake rape crisis tour is somehow diminishing the horror of sexual assault. 
They also use a quote from an article she wrote in the early 2000s about the court case of another abuser on trial. Here she is with ABC commentator and known feminist Virginia Trioli discussing the offending quote. Quotes such as in 2005 when you describe Robert Potter, that convicted pedophile and former scoutmaster, as a good bloke, and when you lamented the moral panic over pedophilia saying such minor abuse rarely has lasting consequences. Do you regret those comments? No, I don't at all. I've, I've talked, I have spent my life speaking out about things that people don't want to discuss. There is ample evidence that sexual abuse does not always have lasting consequences. In fact, there was a Melbourne psychiatrist who for years spoke out about what the research was saying about this. You, there you, there what, is a, a spectrum as, of abuse that sure. has differential consequences. In relation to the Robert Potter issue, uh, case, he was a scoutmaster. What I wrote about was the fact that some of the people he'd been working with for years, former uh, kids who'd worked, who'd come, who'd been involved in his scout movement, uh, friends of his, professionals, came along to the court case, and they were na the, the audience was named by the Sydney Morning Herald as. Uh, 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 do be doing the wrong thing and supporting this man. Okay. I I argued that was a crazy thing. Okay. That we are I want, not I want to, uh, we're, not, we're not prepared to... He hadn't even been convicted sure. at that point. It's all such typical feminist behaviour, but Bettina really does seem to cop it worse than the rest of us non-left-wing women. The main contributing factor to this rampant feminist hatred of Bettina is that she has very successfully, with facts and logic, critiqued and deconstructed the two core narratives of the fourth wave feminist movement. And in the absence of facts themselves, feminists have no choice but to try to beat her into silence because they are terrified that not only is Bettina correct on a lot of points, but that she is effective in communicating to the general public information that feminists simply do not want people to know. Bettina poses an existential threat to the feminist movement in Australia, and for that alone, she is being punished. And that, I don't think, is very fair. If you liked that video, please remember to like, subscribe, share, leave me a comment, and if you really, really liked it, then check out the video description for my subscribe star link and other ways you can support me.